is the blueprint to becoming a millionaire and I'm gonna walk you through the levels to becoming one. Level one is the fundamentals of wealth creation and we're gonna start with what even is a millionaire? It's someone whose net worth, excluding their primary residence, is in excess of a million dollars. Assets minus liabilities. For example, let's say you own a $1 million house and you owe $500,000 on it. If you had nothing else saved up in your bank account, which I would hope that you did, but let's just say you had nothing else saved up in your bank account, then your net worth would be 500K. In this instance, you would not be a millionaire, right? Now let's call this a $1 million house and you owed nothing on it, your net worth would be a million dollars. Now, there's a difference between having a liquid net worth versus a net worth. A liquid net worth is assets that you can trade in and out of. So if I had a million dollars in cash in my bank account versus owning assets that were worth a million dollars, those are different things. And you might be wondering, how does Alex have any authority to speak on the subject? I'll tell you why. I became a millionaire in my early 20s. I had my first cash million in my bank account when I was 27, and I crossed hundred million dollars in net worth by age 31. So I became a millionaire a hundred times in a row. So I can tell you how to do it at least once. And I've helped over a hundred other people create million dollar plus net worths uh, over my career. And those are just the ones that I know about, let alone all the people in our community have done a lot better than that. And so we go to step two in this little journey of ours, which is equity. Because there's two ways that you can become a millionaire. You can earn your way there or you can own your way there. And the faster way is to own your way there. And that's what I'm gonna walk you through. So I'm gonna walk you through both examples of earning your way there, which is how I first thought it was, versus owning. So if I wanna earn my way to a million dollars, then I'm going to need to make $2 million over X period of time, and then divide that by two because of taxes to get to my $1 million. Let's say I'm making $200,000 a year, and I made $200,000 a year for a decade. That's assuming that you saved 100% of your income. You'd be able to earn your way to $1 million in liquid net worth. On the other hand, you can own your way, meaning that you own assets either, you know, which could be businesses or real estate, which are probably the two most common assets that people own that are trying to invest. When I say invest, when you are an entrepreneur, you are investing, you're just heavily indexed on one stock, which is your own. Let's say that I create a business uh, that gets to $250,000 per year. In some instances, I might be able to sell this company if it was truly automated and had a, a team of people that worked without me needing it. I could sell this at probably a four times multiple. And this is again, that would be a very good multiple for a business that is doing that kind of profit because this is actually a small amount of profit for when we're talking business sales. But that would get us to a $1 million net worth. All right, because we own 100% of this business that makes $250,000 a year in profit without us working at all, and we could sell that for a million dollars. And so you can see the difference here. It's like, okay, well, one of these takes 10 years. This one is just how long does it take me to automate the creation of $250,000 a year? And so what's interesting here is that almost the actual income between the two is almost identical. But as soon as you achieve it, you almost already have the, the net worth because here, time is working against you because you have taxes and you have your living expenses that are cutting out of this every single year. Whereas here, you get the multiplier without your living expenses with time being an ally for you, which takes us to the next step on our journey. Don't diversify. Diversification is for weenies. Diversification, to quote Uncle Warren, is a hedge against ignorance. You only diversify if you don't know what you're doing. The more you know, the less risky it is. I actually am approaching diversification from a focus perspective, which is what's the one thing that you're gonna invest your most valuable resource, because when you're early on, you don't have that much money. So your most valuable resource isn't your money, it's your time and your attention. There's two ways we can allocate it. V1, we do little allocations like this. I'm gonna look at crypto, I'm gonna look at day trading, I'm gonna look at Forex, I'm gonna look at flipping houses, I'm gonna look at long-term investing in real estate, I'm gonna look into Airbnb, I'm gonna look into starting an ATM business, I'm gonna look at, you get the idea, right? So let's say this is you, and this is your time and attention that you have to pursue any new opportunity. So you say, I need seven income streams because the average millionaire has seven income streams. So I'm gonna spread myself thin between seven different opportunities. And while I do that, I'm gonna be multitasking, trying to fill different cups at the same time with different colors, and I'm somehow gonna wait until one of these things takes off, right? I have to see which ones of these will work. 
But the reality is, it's not which of these ones will work. Any of them could work if you put the work in, but you have to reach a threshold. Once you get to the top, the extra cash starts spilling over and you actually have a profitable opportunity. Which one of these cups is closer to spilling over? You going in on one thing or you spreading yourself between seven? And the reason that this myth continues to proliferate is because it's absolutely true that people who are the wealthiest have multiple income streams. But what's not true is about how they got there. The wealthiest people in the world go all in on one income stream and they keep adding it up over and over and over again until it overflows. And then once it overflows, because they're making so much money from their one opportunity, they then start diversifying back between the other different ways. But they made their wealth focusing on one thing and then they maintain their wealth by distributing it. You don't make money by, by splitting your attention up, you make it by focusing on the one thing that matters most. V2, you say, what do I really like? Well, I do have experience doing this one thing, and so I'm gonna ignore all of these other opportunities and just go all in on one thing. The reason I'm such a big advocate of focusing your attention on one thing is that this is where you get disproportionate returns. Because I think it's very arrogant to think that your 10% of your attention where you're not even that good at business to begin with, spread between 10 things, is somehow gonna compete against somebody who's putting all of their effort on one thing. But here's the fallacy that most people who are starting out don't get. They think, I'm gonna try all of them and see which one works out. Or rather, I'm gonna try to start multiple things and see which one takes off. But the reality is that all of them could take off or none of them could take off, but it's solely based on which one you work on. So it's not which one will work, it's which one will you work on. You wanna go as fast as possible through the I have no idea what I'm doing phase so that you can get to the I do know what I'm doing phase and I understand the risks that are associated with this and that's why I don't wanna diversify because I actually get outsized returns here. There's five stages that you go through as an entrepreneur, when you're considering a new opportunity. Phase one is called uninformed optimism. This is where you are uninformed, but you're like, man, this opportunity sounds so great. Look at all these people making all this money. And so then you dive in. And then you get to something called informed pessimism. You're like, oh wow, this isn't as easy as I thought. There's all these other things that they didn't talk about in this ad or in this highlight reel that they show me on this YouTube short about this person that made $1,000 a day going from nothing from her home, right? So then what happens next is you keep working on it and then you get into the valley of despair. Sad face, sad face. This is where most people quit. And this is what most people do now. Dot, 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 dot. They find another one of these things to get into and they go all the way over back here because they think, oh no, this one has doo-doo on the side of the fence. So I'm gonna to go to the other side of the fence where the grass is green. But what they don't realize is that when they get into that side, it's completely made of manure. And that's why the grass is so green, right? There's poo on both sides. You just didn't know about it until you got there, all right? And so what happens is people keep repeating the cycle over and over and over again, and they never make progress. And so here's the thing, is that when you do find something that you're like, you know what, I kinda of like this. Okay, this is harder than I originally thought. I need to keep learning. Wow, this is actually really hard. There's a lot more pieces to this than I understood at the beginning. I guess this is why everyone isn't rich. And then something magic happens. You then start to have informed optimism. You now start to realize you've wrapped your arms around whatever the opportunity is or whatever thing you're pursuing. And you're like, okay, I haven't gotten there yet, but I understand the math. I understand the process of getting where I am to where I'm trying to go. And ultimately, this is what I'm trying to do with this blueprint for you. Is it, if I can help you tackle as much of this or at least compress the time that it takes you to get here, that's a big victory for me. And then you finally get to the final phase, which is achievement, which is you actually accomplish externally what you set out to. And most newbies fall out between here and here and then start this process over again. So most people only relive this over and over and over again without ever making it to here. Which then naturally leads you to here because then you have no desire to diversify because you now get it. And what do you do when you're here? You reset the, you reset the target. And you say, this is where I wanna go next. And because you've been through this process once, you understand that, you know what? Me going after this 10 times bigger goal sounds amazing. I'm gonna find out there's some stuff that sucks. There's gonna be a period where it's gonna really suck and it's gonna feel hopeless because I don't see how, how to get through it. I'm gonna keep chugging and then understand how to get there. And then I'm gonna get there, I'm gonna repeat the process. So now we go to the last part of level one of becoming a millionaire. The long game. If I told you to build the tallest tower you possibly could in 10 seconds, here's what you might do. Boom. Five. 
four, three, two, one. Time, right? Now, imagine I told you to build the tallest building you possibly could in 10 days. You would probably say, you know what? I can probably get some more boxes. How flimsy is this, right? Like how stable is this? Do you think this is gonna last a long time? Probably not. So I might build it piece by piece from the ground up with more stable bricks from day one. And I would keep doing it this way, right? And I'd keep adding and keep adding and keep adding. And then when 10 days came, I might be five stories high. And so the reason this is such an important frame shift for people is that the fact that they're in a rush causes them to build the thing they want to build differently. The fastest way to get to this tall is to build it the exact way I did earlier. Stack it end to end up to this point. But if I then said, I need you to build something that's 10 stories tall, you would never get there. And what happens is people get stuck, right? They get stuck at this level and they can't add another one on top. And they stay here and they're like, why can't I get my million dollar business to $10 million? And it's because you built it wrong to begin with. And so as much as this sounds painful, sometimes the fastest way to get to 10 million is to start back at zero and build it right to begin with. I talk so much about long game and about making sure that you're building it the right way because this thing is never gonna last. And so the hardest thing about building something right is that in the beginning, you need to have something to sell. You need your amazing, valuable thing. And then, that's a megaphone, it's terrible. But then you need to advertise it to let people know about stuff. And then, you start making sales. But the problem is that people get to this point and then think, oh, I need to do mark more marketing and sales, right? Because that's what made me money. But the problem is the more you market and sell, the more people actually find out that this is not a gift and this is actually a big pile of shit. And so what happens is now you've got people who buy this thing and tell their friends, this thing stinks. And then over time, it becomes more and more expensive for you to advertise because your reputation stinks. And so the right way to build it is to understand that you have to build the thing first, and then you gotta let people know about it. But then you don't crank on this. You keep fixing this thing until this guy becomes a happy camper and tells his friends. And until that happens, you keep making this thing better. And this is the same thing as if I did this and just kept gassing it, that's me vertically building the tower and then reaching a max that I can't go past anymore. Versus, building it so that I get people to say, wow, this thing's amazing. And so then they also tell people for me so that when I get to that point, I actually built it with a huge base of foundation and I can keep stacking on top of it. And that's the difference in terms of mindset and perspective of how you actually build something that's going to last. And then along the way with your team and the people that you hire, rather than saying, hey, I just need a body in the seat. I just need a person to do this thing. You're like, who here has talent? And I might interview 20 people for one role rather than three so I get the right person. If you feel stuck all the time and you can't make progress, you usually need to go back to the beginning and realize that you built a vertical business that had no foundation to begin with. And now we have our foundation built for level one of wealth creation. Level two is all about the actual tactics of getting to making your first million. And it starts with finding a hungry crowd. Let me explain what I mean by find a hungry crowd. This guy started a business selling hot dogs and he was given one wish from a genie of what competitive advantage he would be able to have. The first thought he had was like, maybe I'll make my hot dogs cheaper. The genie shook his head and was like, no. He's like, hmm, what if I made my hot dogs taste better? And the genie said, no, don't waste your wish on that. Maybe I'll just make mine the fastest cooking so I can serve the hot dogs faster. And the genie said, that's not what you wanna waste your wish on. The genie looked at him, holding the hot dogs and buns in hand, and said, it's not about the hot dogs. If you wanna build an amazing business, you wanna put your hot dog stand on the best corner in front of a starving crowd. Because if your hot dog stand is on the corner, it doesn't matter how cheap they are, how good they taste, how fast they cook, the moment that hungry crowd walks out and sees your hot dog stand, they're gonna sell it every time. So right off the bat, I wanna talk about two key concepts when it comes to finding a hungry crowd. One is that we have to understand that the market is always gonna be the strongest variable in how much money you make, right? If you're selling toilet paper during COVID, you're gonna sell out, right? Because it didn't matter how good your toilet paper was, there was a starving crowd. And so supply demand, which is one of the reasons that we have it as our logo, it is the strongest force in all of economics and business. It is the core thing that everything else is built on. And so you have to understand that the market is number one. If I was trying to sell services to newspaper companies, well, newspaper companies are decreasing by 25% per year, compounding negatively in the wrong direction. The next lever on this, 
is the offer that you give people, right? If you have a superior offer, then if you're in a normal market, that'll be the next lever that you have. If I say, hey, start for free, and I only get paid if you get some sort of result, and it's a truly free, low risk, amazing value, and you get results tomorrow offer, then you're gonna sell 10 times, 100 times more than someone who just has like a, you pay me, and maybe you get results, and maybe you don't type of service or product. The final thing is your ability to persuade. Ideally, go after a really big market with an amazing offer and be a hell of a persuader. But the thing is, is you can be terrible at persuading and have a terrible offer and say you can only buy my toilet paper in 80 roll chunks or I'm not gonna sell it to you and still sell out during COVID. But if it's not COVID, then it's, how can I make the toilet paper offer that I have significantly more compelling? And if all the toilet paper offers look the same, then it just comes down to how well I can persuade people to buy mine. That's concept one when it comes to finding a hungry crowd. Concept two is the four things that I look for when I'm actually trying to find that market. Number one is I want people who are in pain. You wanna make sure that the people that you're selling to are in desperate need. They don't want, but must have the thing that you are selling. The second is that they must have the ability to buy. So purchasing power. So a friend of mine had a business where he helped people who were unemployed fix their resumes so that they could get a job. Now, you might be like, oh wow, tons of pain, absolutely. But the problem was, he kept trying to grow this business and he couldn't grow it because they were all broke because they didn't have a job. The third factor that I look for is easy to target. Because at the end of the day, even if you have somebody who's in lots of pain who can buy your thing, if you can never find them, it doesn't matter because they're never gonna buy your thing because they'll never know you exist. And so if I have the choice between two different marketplaces and one of them is like nurses, incredibly easy to find, or something that is way harder to find, like psychedelic Aztecs in you know Croatia, way harder to target. I, and you know what? They might have a huge pain and lots of purchasing power to buy my thing, but if I can't find them, it's irrelevant. The fourth one you wanna have is that you have a growing market. Now I gave the example earlier about the newspapers, right? So believe it or not, a good friend of mine actually had a business that sold a rev share model to newspapers. So he was an amazingly persuasive guy, he had an amazing offer, which was zero risk. He just said like, let me get a percentage of the revenue that I bring to you, all right? So these two things were completely maxed out, but he couldn't figure out why his company wasn't growing every year. He was beating his competitors and gaining more customers than they were, but still slipping away in terms of his ability to grow. And it was because the entire marketplace as a whole was shrinking. And so you wanna make sure that you have all four of these things. You can't just have three of them or two of them or one of them. You need to have all four. And so when you're thinking about what thing you wanna sell, Start with who you want to sell it to. So you have your hungry crowd, now what do you do? One avatar, one product, one channel. This is the simplest formula to getting to a million dollars plus. All you have to do is find one person that you want to help. It's just making sure that you're very clear on the one very specific person that you are going to help. That is the avatar. The next thing is you want to give them one product. And the reason I say it's one product is that a lot of people overcomplicate their businesses too early. They're like, man, if I want to double my business, I should sell them three things, right? And then I'll get them to buy more stuff. But the thing is, is that if you're under a million dollars, you're just adding a ton of complexity when you don't even have that many customers. And so most times you'd be better served sticking with the one thing that you're selling and saying, how can I sell three times as many of the exact same person? And that becomes the problem that you solve. But most people get confronted with these issues and then go for the easy route. And again, this is like that building where you can add something on top really quickly, but it doesn't create the skyscraper that you want. Instead, you wanna think, how can I do more? The third variable here is channel. Now, it doesn't matter what channel you're currently acquiring customers on. You can hit a million dollars plus on literally any channel that you advertise on without going onto new channels. So if you do outreach, as in you reach out to people one-on-one -on -one to get customers, whether that's cold calls, cold emails, DMs, you can expand and continue to get more customers with that one channel. If you post content, you can keep posting content on whatever channel you're on and just do it better. Post more content, post better content. And by doing so, you'll increase the amount of customers still with only one money-making product. Or let's say you're running ads. Obviously, if you're running ads, you can just spend more money on the ads provided you're doing it profitably. And if you can't expand past a million dollars a year profitably with paid ads, you have a business problem or you have a pricing problem. You don't actually need to add another channel because then it, again, complicates your business because you're like, okay, well, I'm currently doing you know, 500,000 a year on YouTube. You know what I'm gonna do? You might think, oh, I'm gonna start doing cold emails, right? As my next way of getting customers. 
Well, that majorly complicates your business when you're this early on. Now you might be thinking, wait, shouldn't I have diversity of, of how you acquire customers? I thought you said that, that was a good idea. It is, but you're so small, it doesn't matter yet because you're not looking at a potential acquirer who's gonna try and look for to decrease risk. For you, you just need to get better at doing the one thing that you do well because you're really probably not that good yet. And as terrible as that may sound, it's probably real, all right? And so the fastest way to get to the million is to build it right from the get-go and not overcomplicate your business, which means you pick one avatar, one product, and one channel that you focus on until you get there. So now we go back to our tactics of building our first million dollars. The next thing at level two is our offer. Now, I wrote an entire book on this thing, $100 million offers, and it answers the question, what should I sell? And it's because that's the most common question that I get asked every single day for people who are trying to start a business, which makes sense. What am I supposed to sell? So I call this the value equation. Now, fundamentally, you've probably heard all over the internet, you need to provide value. You gotta give value, right? But the question is, what is value? And after doing a lot of studying of figuring this out between our portfolio companies, it actually comes down to four variables. Variable number one is the dream outcome. What the dream outcome is for whoever the prospect that you pick is, the way that you can compare two different dream outcomes is how much more valuable they think one outcome is versus another. If I were to talk to a 30-year-old man and say, hey, I can help you lose weight or I can make you a millionaire, most guys would value being a millionaire more than let's say being handsome. There are different outcomes that people will ascribe different values to. And that's just a very extreme example. Well, let's use the weight loss example and let's switch it to women. If I have one ebook that helps someone lose weight and then I've got a one-on-one -on -one personal training program that helps someone lose weight, it's the same dream outcome. So then what then determines which one is more valuable? Because the ebook might be 50 bucks and be overpriced and the personal training might be $5,000 and be underpriced. How can you make that discrepancy? Because there's more value. Let me explain. The next one is perceived likelihood of achievement, meaning, when I buy, how likely do I think I will get what I want through buying? If I buy a $50 ebook on good meals that I can cook that are healthy, maybe I'll get some food that I might like in here and I can feel a little better about myself, but they don't realistically think that they're gonna all of a sudden transform their entire body from a $50 ebook. Now, if you sign up for personal training for a year, you probably have a way bigger perceived likelihood of achievement and so you value it higher. Now, both of these elements, the dream outcome and the perceived likelihood of achievement are the things that you want to increase in your communication with a prospect. You're saying it's really, really likely that you're gonna get this thing that you really, really want. The next two variables of the equation are the painful side of the equation, which is what does someone have to give up in order to get it? So the first thing that we have is time. And there's two elements of time. There's micro and macro. Micro is how long is this gonna take every day? There's a certain amount of time that's gonna take on the micro for them to experience the result, right? So if I'm talking about the lady who's doing personal training, she might have to go to the gym three times a week. That's gonna take time. She might have to prepare food. That's gonna take time. That's on the micro level. On the macro level, how long is she gonna have to do these micro commitments in order to get the macro result that she wants? She might have to lose 50 pounds and it might take her 18 months. So macro, the goal is, I want this to be as little as possible micro time, and I want this to be as short as possible on the macro, so that when I say, hey, you're gonna get the dream body you want, you absolutely know that you're gonna get it, and it's gonna happen really, really fast. So the next thing is effort and sacrifice. Effort is what you have to start doing that you weren't doing, that you don't wanna do as a result of the purchase. Sacrifice are things that you have to stop doing that you wish you could do, but can't do anymore as a result of the purchase. And so for our lovely young lady, she's gonna have to sacrifice margarita Mondays and taco Tuesdays. She's no longer gonna be able to get to do that even though she wants to do that. She's gonna have to sacrifice sleeping in on the weekends and she's gonna have to start waking up early and working out and eating food that she doesn't like. And so effort and sacrifice tend to be dual sides of the same coin. Whatever you have to start doing, you typically have to stop doing something else. The top side, we try and increase. The bottom side, we try and decrease. We wanna get it to zero. Because if you think about this in a hypothetical extreme, the perfect offer that would have the absolute most value would be the biggest, most compelling dream you can possibly imagine that you're absolutely guaranteed to get instantly with no effort. So if I said you can click a button on my website and then look down at your abs and then have a six pack, that would be the hypothetical extreme value. Now people can get that through personal training, changing their diet and waiting 12 months. But because of this, the value is significantly decreased because there are costs associated. Understanding all four of these variables is how you craft offers that get people to say yes and give you money. Because oftentimes, the most expensive part of the offer that you have 
isn't the money. It's the other things that they have to start doing as a result of the purchase. Those are called hidden costs. If I have a marketing agency, okay, and I do content for people, all right, and when I start doing content, I say, okay, it's gonna take us 60 days to ramp up, we're gonna start having two calls a week for an hour, you're gonna to have to fly out to my studio and we're gonna record, and it's gonna take 60 days before you're gonna start seeing any kind of traction. Imagine that offer compared to somebody who says, you don't need to do anything, I can just draw stuff on my own, immediately start posting, and your phone's gonna to ring today. Well shoot, which one's more valuable? It's still the same core services, but how we wrap them, make them probably 10 times more valuable than they were before. And that's why understanding these variables and making the right offer is so compelling on your road to your first million. And the reason this was my first book is that offers is about strategy. Offers is one of the largest levers that you can pull with any business because it actually affects all departments. When you change the offer, it changes how you market. When you change the offer, it changes the sales script, the sales process. When you change the offer, it changes what you deliver. It literally affects everything. And so for us, we always try and nail this with our portfolio companies at acquisition.com. To be clear, we don't sell coaching. We invest in businesses and buy them. And for context, our average portfolio company over the first 12 months, 1.8X is revenue and 3.01X is profit. And over their first 24 months, they 2.8X revenue and 4.7X profit, meaning that they disproportionately drop the increase in revenue to their bottom line because we make sure that the thing that we are selling is as valuable as humanly possible. So the next on our journey of wealth and riches and glory and status and all things amazing is marketing and sales. And if you think about this from a sequence perspective, you have to make the thing and then you have to promote the thing. Now, the making the thing is $100 million offers. What should I sell? The next question is who should I sell it to? AKA getting leads. And you get leads through advertising, which is the concept of my second book, $100 million leads. And then, you get them to buy. But the thing that people mess up is that they then think, okay, I'm gonna do more of that. But what you actually need to do next is you go back to here and you fix the product and keep making it better. And then you promote it more. And then you come back and fix the product and make it better. And it becomes this virtuous cycle. So if we need to understand how to market and sell, then it means that you have to have one advertising method. There are eight ways you can advertise. There's four that you can do, and then there's four that other people can do for you. You can do warm outreach, which is reaching out one-to-one -to, -one to your friends. You can post content one-to-many, but to people who know you. You can run paid ads, which is doing one-to-many to strangers, or you can do one-to-one -to, -one to strangers, which is cold outreach. And if you're like, man, no one's buying my thing, I can guarantee you that you're not doing enough of these core four, period. That's it, because these are the only four things that you can do to advertise. The next thing is that you can get referrals from customers, which are lead getters. Next, you can have employees who help do the core four for you. You can have agencies who run the core four for you, make content for you, do outreach for you, all of those things you can hire another business to help you with. And then finally, you've got affiliates, which some people call influencers, some people call endorsements, but it's somebody who already has an audience, already has a business, and that you compensate in some way to do the advertising for you, the core four, to let other people know about your stuff. These are the eight ways that you can advertise anything to anyone. And the nice thing is when you're starting out for your first million, just pick one. Once you pick the advertising method that you want, and let's say you're using lead getters, you have to learn one of the core four to then get lead getters. And that's okay, that's fine, that's part of business. These will always give you more leverage than the first four, and that's okay. But you have to start with these first. So let's assume that you're just gonna stick to the core four in the beginning because you're like, I don't wanna involve other parties, which I recommend, especially if you're starting out. And you're like, you know what? I'm going to post content. That's what you're gonna do. That's your, your method. All right, now you're gonna have all these people who like your posts, comment on your posts, DM you personally when you make content that they find compelling or interesting and say, hey, I'd love your help on whatever this thing is. Then you transition into sales. Now, it's so important for founders who are starting a company to be in, integrally involved in both of these processes. The reason you want the founder to be integrally involved in the beginning is one, it's cheaper. And especially when you have less cash, that makes sense. Two, these are skills that you're gonna, that are gonna be required for you to succeed over the long haul. So you're gonna wanna understand them at a tactical level because when you bring someone else in in the future, these lead getters, whether it's employees, agencies, affiliates, or whatever, you can teach them the right way to do it. And when they say, hey, that's not possible, you can be like, no, it is, let me show you how. And then you have a litmus test of who's legit and who's not, who's gonna help you on your journey. Whether you're hiring them or you're incentivizing them, it works the same. When it comes to the sales side, we want to get into a choreographed process, knowing what step one through letter Z of the process looks like to get someone from 
I think this might be interesting to giving you money. But if you don't know what you're doing first, you have to throw stuff on the wall and see what sticks. And a lot of it's just gonna be your gut in the beginning and figure out, whoop, that didn't work, whoop, that didn't, oh, that one actually got a response. All right, that's step two. And you keep trying until you get to step three and then you keep trying until you get to step four until eventually somebody gives you money. And then you backtrack and say, what happened to this person that is do these steps, great. Now I'm gonna try and recreate that as many times as I can and then that becomes your process. And that process repeats at each micro level too because that might be three or four steps to get to the conversation where someone might give you money and then what do you do in that conversation? Well, when I ask this question first, and this question second, and this question third, it's more likely that they ultimately buy. And so if you don't follow a script in the beginning, you better make one, because if you're gonna eventually get out of sales, which you should if you wanna scale, then you're gonna be able to teach somebody else how to sell too. And one of the biggest issues early on is that the founder is the most convicted about the product, and you should be, it's your company. But people who come after you are never gonna be as charismatic or as convicted in the thing that you have as you are, which means you need to follow a process to maximize the likelihood that the prospects that they speak with ultimately purchase. The next level in our blueprint or journey to wealth, the mountain of Mordor, and by Mordor I mean more money, is paying yourself. How much should you pay yourself? When should you pay yourself? Of all the topics we're gonna to talk about today, this is probably the most subjective. And the reason for that is because it underlines one key concept that is 100% personal, which is risk tolerance, which is how much risk are you willing to take individually? One of the regrets that I have earlier on as I continue to double down on my gym chain was that I took all the profit from each gym and I kept putting it into the next gym. And I basically took nothing out for the entire time. Now that's super risky. I was living on nothing, living cheap. I was eating cheap. I had a cash car that I owned outright and I just put everything I had, spent every hour of my day growing my business. Eventually though, I ended up losing all the money from selling all my gyms and was left with nothing. And if I had taken out some cash during that period of time, I would have had two benefits. Benefit number one is that when you really try and take out cash flow from the business, you'd be amazed at how much cash flow just magically appears. And so I like having bank account PRs be a good personal goal for every entrepreneur. Even if the increment that you're increasing is small, it does two things. One, it forces you to take cash out of the business. So it forces cash flow. The second is that it forces you to decrease your spending personally. And I have a strong belief that as you're coming up, learning the discipline to spend less, if you increase the cash that they take out of the business and you spend less over time, then your bank account has nowhere to go but up. And I can promise you that when you have a very full bank account, business decisions become less stressful. And when you make less stress decisions, you make better decisions. I do believe in taking some money out of the business along the way, because let's be real, you're going to live a long life and then you're going to die. And if you double down every single minute until the day that you died, you'd build the most enterprise value, but you'd live a really shitty life. So at some point, you have to balance the investment versus consumption of life itself or the fruit of your labor. That is why I'm a believer in at least allocating a certain percentage of the cash flow from the business to you personally. A healthy way of thinking about this that we have for some of our uh, heavy capital intensive businesses, meaning like brick and mortar chains, which is one of the biggest parts of our portfolio, this is one back of napkin way that you can use. 33% goes to you, 30% goes to growth, which is new locations, and then this is rainy day. This is cash reserves to the business, cash reserves to you, and this is for new locations. Another way of doing it is something called a watermark. We know that we need to grow two locations, and this is a proxy. It doesn't have to be two locations. It could be hiring two people, hiring two reps. It doesn't matter. Or two more developers if you're a software company. It works the same. Two more per month costs X dollars. We have Y profit. So all we do is we say whatever the profit is at the end of the month, we subtract this, and then we have a watermark above which we always leave in the account. And then everything else, we distribute as cash flow. That's a different way of doing it. This is a little bit more aggressive if you want to maintain a certain growth rate. This one is a little bit more flexible. It really depends on you and your tolerance for risk. And that's one, one thing that I'd say I pride myself on in terms of our ability to help portfolio companies and newer founders who are creating their first kind of generational wealth is these are hard conversations to have and are really important conversations to have. And you want somebody who isn't a financial advisor who's trying to get you to take as much cash out so that they can invest and get their 1% fee. You want somebody who's on the same side of the table as you being like, I get where you're at, I can see where your wealth is, and also sees over the next 24, 36, 60 months what it looks like for us to just have that one big bloop so you never have to work again. We're now approaching the second level of the pinnacle of our second level, which is setting goals. And I think this is a really misunderstood topic. Most people think like, oh, I need smart goals or specific measurable goals. Bad. I'll show you how I do that. All right, so rather than focusing on outcomes, we focus on activities. So the goal shouldn't be what happens, but the goal should be what we do. I had a buddy of mine 
So they started doing 10 grand a month, 20 grand a month, 30 grand a month. And then he would fall off. And I was like, why do you keep falling off? He said, well, I make the money and I hit my goal, so then I like ease off the gas pedal. And I said, it's because you're defining your goals the wrong way. I see you as not hitting your goal every time you're not doing the activities. And so I said, make the activities the goal, and then you'll hit it every time and more. And so then he flipped how he saw his own success into simply, at the end of the day, did he do all the things that he said he was going to do at the beginning of the day? And then you can actually control your inputs, because inputs are what drive outputs. Don't make the goal outputs. Say, what am I going to do that would be unreasonable that I don't hit these outputs? So for example, my inputs might be, and this is one of my favorite ways for thinking about like advertising, is something that I call the rule of 100. So the rule of 100 simply states that if you do 100 primary actions over 100 days, you usually get the first result that you ultimately want. Now you hook people by saying you're going to get the first result you want, but the key point is that you're doing 100 actions. And one of my little monikers that I would share with you is count in hundreds. All right, so when a lot of people are like, yeah, I did the thing. How many hundreds did you do? If I was doing warm reach outs, I'd say, cool, reach out to 100 friends a day. If I'm doing cold reach outs, I'd say, cool, reach out to 100 people a day. If I'm making content, cool, make 100 minutes of content every day. If I'm running ads, I'd say, run $100 a day. And each of those are activities that we could say, these things will drive these outputs. They make that the goal. And so at the end of the day, you can say, yes, I did it, or no, I didn't do it. Not, did I make a sale? Because no matter what, even if you didn't make a sale today, you should still do your 100 inputs so that you can make two sales tomorrow. So the second concept we talked about when it comes to goals is how we actually set goals for portfolio companies. And it's not the way that you think, but it is something that you're gonna recognize because we actually use the scientific method. And here's how it works, four simple boxes. One is what problem are we actually trying to solve? A lot of times we spend the most time on this part of this because a lot of times people are like, oh, I think we need to redo our logo. Why? What is that going to accomplish? What constraint are we alleviating? Right, because for us, we back our goals into the constraints of the business. Because let's say that conversion rate on our homepage is not a problem. Well, then why do we need to redesign the logo? Oh, we don't. One of my favorite ways to solve problems is to decide they're not a problem to begin with. So this is how number one, which is what problem are we solving? The second is, what's our hypothesis? Which is an if then statement. X, then Y. So what that means is, I say, my hypothesis is, if our website is low conversion, that's the problem that we're solving, my hypothesis is that if we redesign the website, we will then get increased conversions. And then all we have to do is say, how do we measure X and Y? How do I measure that we redesign it? I could say, yes or no, I did it. Or I can say that we hold a split test every Monday that we run over the quarter. That would be the X. That's something I could say, yes or no, we did it. And then Y, my conversion rate, let's say we're at 10%. And then I would say, is it greater than 10%? Yes or no. And then finally, the last thing is, did we do it? And then did it work? We figure out the problem we're solving. We figure out what our hypothesis is to solve it. We determine how we're gonna measure whether or not we did or whether or not it happened. And then we say, did we do the thing? And then did it happen? Because we could not do the thing and then it wouldn't matter and we have to repeat it later and solve the problem of why are we not doing this thing? But if we did do the thing, then either it improved it or maybe we redesigned the website and the conversion rate didn't improve. So either that might not be the constraint or our hypothesis was wrong. And so this allows you to iteratively improve the business. So we covered the fundamentals of wealth creation. Then we talked about how to create our first million, and now we've got it. And now level three, we're talking about staying rich and getting richer. Getting rich once. So uh, one of my mentors uh, was an ex-Goldman Sachs employee. One of his mentors at Goldman Sachs told him you should only have to get rich once. And I heard that saying, and it's really stuck with me, is if you play the game right, you should only have to play it once. And then after that, you should be playing with house money the whole time and never take bets that you would lose the farm over. In other words, never bet the empire on a pot of gold. But this is the very first passage in $100 million offers. Outsized returns often come from betting against conventional wisdom, and conventional wisdom is usually right. Given a 10% chance of 100 times payoff, you should take that bet every time, for you're still going to be wrong 9 times out of 10. We all know that if you swing for the fences, you're going to strike out a lot, but you're also going to hit some home runs. The difference between baseball and business, however, is that baseball has a truncated outcome distribution. When you swing, no matter how well you connect with the ball, the most runs you can get is four. 
in business, every once in a while, you, when you step up to the plate, you can score a thousand runs. This long tail distribution of returns is why it's important to be bold. Big winners pay for so many experiments. That's from Jeff Bezos. So if you do hit it out of the park, you shouldn't want to have to bet everything on it again to keep staying rich. When you get that one winning bet or that one winning ball that comes and you knock it out of the park, you, shouldn't, you should be able to win for good. And so that's why one of my favorite sayings when it comes to wealth building is that fortunes are created through taking huge risks with small amounts of money. But fortunes are preserved by taking small risks with lots of money. So we talked about why you should only have to get rich once. And if you are going to swing for the fences, you still need to be very sure that once you hit it, you never bet it all on black again. Which then leads us actually to our next one, people. So I'm going to explain a concept called the quad marketing calendar. All right. So you think about this as internal and external to your business. Now you've got prospects on this side. We got customers, candidates, we got employees. And so you actually need to be marketing in all four directions at all times. Most people spend all their time advertising here. They say, okay, I'm gonna spend all my resources advertising to get prospects. And then they convert those prospects over this money line and they turn those prospects into customers. But the problem is if you only advertise in this direction, who's gonna deliver the thing to these customers? Well, you need employees which means that you also need to be advertising to get candidates to turn into employees. And so this is ultimately the dual-sided nature of advertising. Because as you grow the left side, you need to also grow the right side. If you wanna to continue to get these customers to buy again and again and again, then we also need to advertise in this direction to the customers to get them to buy again and again. So we advertise to prospects and customers. We advertise to get customers to become repeat customers. We advertise to candidates to turn them into employees. And then we advertise to employees to get them more engaged and to keep them engaged and keep educating them so they can ascend up and provide even more value to our customers, ultimately to the enterprise value of the company. So if you ever feel like you're a genius with a thousand hands, it usually means that you're really good at advertising and turning prospects into customers. Right? But you're really bad at turning candidates into employees and then training employees to get to become even better. And so the more you advertise here, the more you feel like you have to do because you have no one else helping you out. So let's say we've got our genius scenario, we've got an enterprise scenario. So if you're the genius with a thousand hands, right? And you're making $5 million top line and $2 million of income. Every year you make $2 million, which adds a million dollars after taxes to your net worth. This is a lot like before, right? But here's the difference between the example I'm going to explain now and what I was talking about before. In this instance, you add the million dollars to your business, but you also have a probably $10 million asset as business if this thing truly runs value. EV is short for enterprise value. So there is no enterprise value here because it's just a genius with a thousand hands. You're just doing with a thousand helpers. Here, you own something that provides value to a group of customers that you can sell to somebody else because if, it, if you require no work in order to provide the value, it means it requires someone else to do no work to provide the value, which means it becomes a more valuable asset. And so if I took a business from genius with a thousand hands, making $2 million a year, and I didn't increase the revenue, and I didn't even increase the profit, but I simply removed the genius and make the structure of the business genius, the people who work inside of it and the processes and the systems that they follow genius, then I add $10 million to the net worth of the person who owns it. And so the, one of the fastest ways to create wealth is make the thing that you have reliable, is to make it risk-free and make sure that it will last. And so even if it took you two years to do that, for you to get $10 million of an enterprise value or, or net worth gain, you'd have to make $20 million of income to get to that same 10 million. But meanwhile, while you're building it, you're still also making money in this scenario, which is what we basically do for the majority of businesses that we have at acquisition.com, is that we often take businesses doing 2 million, 3, 4, 5, et cetera, and then take them to this side and say, hey, let me show you what it looks like at 10, with a 7x multiple, and so now you go from a one or two or three million dollar net worth to a 70 million dollar net worth. And that is how you get wealthy. This is how you get rich. Now I want to be clear, you can absolutely get two million dollars a year in profit with not a lot of people, or even just on your own, because with the increases of AI and automation and things like that, like we're gonna see more big companies with fewer and fewer headcount. But 
until the day until general AI comes in and just crushes everyone, people are still required to get to where you want to go. So if you want to not just make a million bucks or a couple of million bucks and you want to get to 10, 20, 50, 100 million dollars and beyond, you got to get the people side right. And now we go to the reputation side. Ooh, a fun one. Imagine all these flowers as different life experiences that you've gone through. If you look at them all here, this isn't a bouquet. This is just a lot of random things put together. Now, when we do this and we combine them all, we now have something much closer to a bouquet. And when you put all of your personal life experiences and your skills and your character traits together, you create a bouquet. And in other words, you create a reputation. But a bouquet doesn't really exist. All we did was we associated things that were separate and then we put them together. And so you can strengthen your reputation by putting more and similar types of experiences together. So you're like, oh, he's got a strong interest in this thing. Now, if every single one of these would be different and some of these were weeds, it would be a lot harder to understand what is the point of this thing. And let's say that you had a drunk driving accident, right? All of a sudden, how different does this bouquet look? Which shows you how one negative experience in your life can actually affect how people see the rest of everything else. And so when we're thinking about brand or building a reputation, I like to think of as what flowers do I want in my bouquet and which things am I ultimately trying to emphasize or not include at all? And what associations are gonna be ones that strengthen this and which are gonna be ones that break it apart? So reputation is a different word for saying what a brand is. And a brand is simply an association between something you know and something you don't know. When we're building a brand, you want to associate all the things that you want someone to think about you with the thing that they don't know yet, which is you. Now, for me, the more my personal brand has grown, the more I have transposed acquisition.com's association with me. And so now when my team goes out to the airport and is wearing a hat that says acquisition.com, people are like, dude, can I buy that hat from you? Because they've gotten value from my videos in my books. They see association with that value and they want to pay for it. But if this just had a random shape on it, they would have no desire to pay 50 if this actually happened. One of my director of HR worked at the airport and a random person came up and was like, I pay you $100 for the hat. And she said, no, obviously, because that's not how our brand works. We gotta earn it. So the idea is that that is fundamentally how branding works. If I'm Louis Vuitton, right? I'm gonna be the world's worst Louis Vuitton symbol, right? If I'm Louis Vuitton, what do I do? I get Kim Kardashian to wear my clothing or carry my purse. And then lady who doesn't have status says, man, I wanna be like Kim, but I can't buy Kim, so I buy the thing that I've associated with Kim. And then when I wear it, I'll have the status by proxy from her. And that's fundamentally how the luxury market works, but it's also how every market works. Now, why do brands drop celebrities when they make a racial slur or they get into an accident or they get arrested for fraud because that becomes an association that people do know and then they don't like and so they say i don't want to associate our brand with that and so they say we're going to break this association and so when you're building a brand it's being very particular about what and who you want to associate with if i have a porn star next to me and i have a porn star co-host you're going to think very different things about me, even if the material is exactly the same. And you might be like, that's flawed. Welcome to humanity and psychology, right? Doesn't matter about whether it's flawed or not. I can just tell you that this is how it works. And so when you're building a reputation, especially in the B2B or the BSC space, you want to provide value, right? We talked about value creation earlier. And so it means that you want to give things that people want in a fast and easy way for them to consume that's risk-free. And so when we do that, you compound customer surplus. The street word for that is goodwill, which is what amount of value did someone get in excess of what they paid for? So let's say I pay a dollar for something and I feel like I got $5 worth of value, right? Everything here between the two lines is customer surplus or what we like to call goodwill. But the interesting thing about this is that if I do this over and over and over again, these things aren't additive in my experience they've been multiplicative. Meaning if I keep providing something good, and that's why it's so hard as a brand to decide when do I want to monetize something? Because the thing is, is that the next time you provide even more value, when people think that you're going to monetize, 
they love you that much more and you get that much more reach and more goodwill so that the next time, and so it's basically reinvesting, but rather than reinvesting capital, you're reinvesting goodwill. Because what I can tell you is that goodwill compounds faster than revenue. You can build a $100 million brand in three years and to build $100 million in revenue might take you way longer than that. And that's because if you just focus on providing goodwill at scale, you get a disproportionate return. The Rock was able to overnight build Terramana into a $6 billion company simply based on his brand. And Huda Beauty built her beauty line into a billion dollar brand. Conor McGregor with Proper 12, billion dollar brand. George Clooney, billion dollar brand. And so they understood this concept, which is that this will grow faster. And so they disproportionately invest early into this so that later they can monetize and do the right hook, the big bloop to the audience. And to quote Uncle Warren, it doesn't matter how much goodwill you have, any number, no matter how big it is, multiplied by zero equals zero. So if you make a bet in the investing world that you then lose all the money, and you had 30 years of good investing make, and you go all in on one bet and you lose, you lose it all. You undo 30 years of good decisions with one bad decision. And that's the thing that a lot of people don't calculate when they think about their personal brand. If we're going back to these flowers like I had earlier, if I have this one broken flower, it forever affects the way this bouquet looks. Imagine you gave this to your wife or your girlfriend and you just said, hey, here you go. You'd be like, it's such an eyesore that it distracts from all the other flowers that you have. And so that's why making sure that you never risk your reputation to make the short money so that you can let the goodwill keep compounding, let the party keep going, is one of the smartest and hardest long-term business decisions. Because believe me, if I start OnlyFans tomorrow, I'll bet you, probably make a lot of money. It's like, but it would be like this broken flower and it would permanently affect how people perceive me and the brand that I also want to build. So now we finished reputation and we're gonna talk about compounding. One of those big fancy words for investing, about how to get rich and stay richer. Compounding is when something multiplies unto itself. All right, so if I have $100 and it compounds at 10% a year, next year it'll be at $110. The year after that, I add 10% of this number, which is a 121, right? And then the next year, 133, and so forth. And so you notice that even though the time between these intervals remain the same, the actual amount that we're growing continues to rise proportionally to how much we have, which is how Uncle Warren can have a hundred billion dollars and still make another fifteen billion dollars this coming year, right? It's because he understands the power of compounding, and they call it the eighth wonder of the world. And in the last decade, Warren Buffett has made more money than he made in over the rest of his career, and that's because the longer you do it, the better it gets which is why some of these early wealth building fundamentals are so important. Compounding only unlocks if you have a long-term perspective because this early first four years, I mean, decent, but not bad. But if you do that over 30 years, it becomes unbelievable. And it's also why you have to not diversify because if we were then splitting this up and saying, you know what, maybe I'm gonna stop this. We're interrupting the compounding process. And equity is one of the single greatest compounding vehicles because you can reallocate capital within the same vehicle. Right? And a simple example of that would be like, if I have 10 locations and I can grow by 10% every month, then I go from 10 locations to 11 locations. And next month I get 12 locations. Next month I get 13. And by my 20th month, I can open two locations. I get to 22, then 24. And it compounds because by that time, you will built out the infrastructure to sustain a faster pace. So Panda Express, they added 600 locations this year. They had 2,000 at the beginning of the year. That took them 45 years to get to. This is one year. They grew more in this one year than they did in any prior year before that. And that's why you just have to stick with it for a long period of time. And this is one of the things that people don't realize about restarting. When you go from year 10 to year 11, you might be incredibly bored with your business. But if you go from 100 million to 110 million, you grew by 10 million. And even though this new thing might sound more exciting in year one, the likely you go from zero to 10 million year one is really unlikely. And so this is where all of the compounding is unlocked, even though it's incredibly boring. 
But if there's one thing I can let you write down, boring is what makes you rich. One of my favorite books from Charlie Munger is that the money isn't made in the buy or the sell. It's made in the wait. And the wait is the hardest part because you have to sit with your hands in your pockets and decide that the original plan that you had was a good plan. And the hard part of the plan is sticking with the plan, not doing the plan. Like deciding that you're gonna work out isn't hard. Deciding that it's gonna be three days a week for the year isn't hard. It's continuing to do it for that entire time is what makes it hard. And I wanted to find a term for you that has been really helpful for me, which is patience, right? A lot of people are like, be patient, be patient. What does that actually mean? Being patient simply means figuring out what to do in the meantime. If I make this video, I am being patient for my stocks that are growing right now. While I'm making this video, I'm being patient for the cut that I want to lose some fat. While I'm making this video right now, I'm being patient for some of our portfolio companies to capitalize on the reinvestments that we're making right now. But I'm making a video. And so what you have to do is that when you stick to the plan, sometimes the best thing you can do is ignore it and let it be, which means that you don't interrupt the compounding process. And there's a famous study that studied patience and impulse control, and there's a one big learning that I think all of us can learn from. So there was a test called the marshmallow test. They took little kids, and they could put a marshmallow in front of them, and they had to wait 30 minutes, and then they could eat the marshmallow. Now, if they ate the marshmallow during the 30 minutes, they didn't get a second marshmallow. If they were able to wait 30 minutes and not eat the marshmallow, then they would give them a second marshmallow at the end. So they got double the reward simply for waiting 30 minutes. Now what was interesting is that they studied the difference between the kids who could resist and the ones who could. And obviously long term, they figured out that the people who could wait and delay gratification are the ones who were more successful. But the strategies that they used to delay was not that they stared at the marshmallow and used their willpower. The kids who were successful did a number of different things. Some of them went to a different side of the room. They just distance themselves from the marshmallow itself. Some of them started singing songs to themselves. Other of them took the marshmallow and put it in their pocket so they couldn't see it anymore. And so the big thing is that they had the skills to figure out what to do in the meantime. And so the more skilled you are, the more ways you can win. And that's why building skills is so important. And it's so important because it allows you to be patient. It gives you something to do in the meantime while you allow your master plan to come to fruition without thinking that you're smarter than you are to begin with. So this concludes almost the get rich for die trying section, AKA level three of wealth building. So let's, but wait Alex, you left that box. I have some observations. That brings us to the very last level, which could even be above the levels, the level above the levels, on the business, not in the business, you know what I'm saying. Enjoy your wealth. Let's talk about it. In my opinion, there are really just two levels of wealth. Level one is that you have all of your personal needs taken care of. The second level of wealth is the unlimited level of wealth, which is that you just always want to keep using money to make more money. And that means that you've progressed from solving your personal needs to playing a game. And so I think what a lot of people do is they can never figure out what enough is for them. And there was a period of my life earlier on where I was like, okay, let me figure out all these rich people things. I bought a Bentley. I was like, let's go out to all the nicest restaurants every single night. But the thing is, is that to live like the 1%, it's actually not that expensive. If you fly private, it costs about $50,000 per month. If you want to eat out every night of the week at the nicest restaurants of you know, $500 dinners every single night, it's 15,000 a month. If you wanted to, let's say, lease a Lamborghini or something, payments are probably five grand a month, right? On top of that, let's say you want to go and buy designer clothing. So that's another $15,000 per month. Let's say you spend $5,000 a month on a nutritionist and another $5,000 a month on therapy and performance coaching, whatever. All right, let's just call it a cool $100,000 per month of expenses. For, oh, we forgot to where we live. Let's, let's live somewhere balling. Let's put another 50 grand a month on here. So $150,000 a month is just under $2 million a year in income. Now that's after tax. Right? So maybe close to $4 million a year in income. Now, that's a good amount of money. It's actually not a lot in the massive scheme of things. And what I mean is that you can ball out all the way balls to the wall for the rest of your life on this level of income. What I would encourage you to do is actually figure out what is good for me. Maybe it's worth it to taste these things and see which of them you actually enjoy. And I think it was really valuable for me to buy the belly and realize I didn't care. And then just, I gave it back six months later. I sold it back at a loss. And so I think the big TLDR here is that you need to figure out what your personal dream list is. And a lot of people have these huge goals, like I want to be a millionaire. It's like, why? Because you can just make this for the rest of your life and ball out. But real now, you can probably live incredibly comfortably on $50,000 a month. Like still, 
1% living, unbelievable wealth looking stuff for, for $50,000 a month after taxes. So I think if you put, what does food look like, right? What does travel look like? What does clothing look like? What does experiences look like? What does health look like? And you start putting an actual number to it, you realize that what you actually need to satisfy your personal needs are significantly less than you originally thought. And so that brings me to the next level of this, which is the game itself. Now there's a reason that my podcast is called The Game. And it's because at this point, I play the game because I enjoy the game. And so the whole concept of enjoying your wealth is not about not working. And I think this is one of the big myths. You might feel that way now because you hate what you do. And the fact that you hate what you do is one of the reasons they might not ever get the wealth you want. And so it's not about not working. It's about getting addicted to freedom. And freedom, again, doesn't mean you don't work. It means you have the option to work. And so I believe that humans are our best when we do work that's worth doing, when we have a purpose that we derive from the effort and the toil that we put in every day. And you get weaker when you don't have an opposing force that's as strong as you. If you lift weights and you never lift even close to your maximum, you eventually start losing muscle. And I think it's the same thing with mental strength. Unless you're continually raising the bar, you eventually atrophy. It's use it or lose it. And so most of us want to become the best versions of ourselves. And in order to become the best versions of ourselves, we have to increase the difficulty of the level that we're playing on. Imagine playing a game that you've beaten a hundred times and then you put it on the easiest level. It gets boring. We think we want easier, but we don't. We want to do things that we enjoy more. And enjoyment and easy are not necessarily the same thing. And so if we're trying to enjoy our wealth, it's finding the things that we can lose ourselves in for the rest of our lives. And being okay with the fact that that thing may shift over time in terms of what it looks like or what it feels like. And if you fast forward all the way to the end of the movie, as a reminder, you die and you can't take any of it with you. And so even if you, if you finish your life with this big pile of money at the end, you still have to push it over the edge of the cliff, right? Where it just falls off to other people whose hands are here because you're dead. <laughs> and so, Reminding myself of that fact every single day reminds me that the whole point of the game is to play the game. And by playing the game, we win the game. Because the best games in life, and I'll finish with this, the best games in life are infinite games, not finite games. And I'll tell you the difference. The point isn't to get married. The point is to stay married. When it comes to business, the point isn't to win at business. The point is to stay in business and literally keep playing. And so when we think about the greatest games that we play as humans, we have to take this infinite frame or we fool ourselves into a false finite prison that we keep wondering why we don't feel like we're winning when we get to the finish line because we never realized that there was no finish line to begin with. And the fact that we were playing the game secured our victory by its very nature. And so this realization helped me reframe how I thought about spending my time so that I could enjoy my wealth. The point for me is to stay in business and see who I can become in this process. The point is for me to see, what does it look like at 20 years of marriage? With health, it's not that like, cool, I've been training for 20 years. I'm in decent shape. I wonder what it looks like when I'm healthy at 50. Because if you're only in shape for six weeks of your life or six months of your life or even six years of your life, who cares? If you only have a good marriage for a few years of your life, who cares? If you only in business and then go out of business really quickly and then you get out of the game, who cares? And which is why the biggest takeaway that you can have, and this is from Winston Churchill, you win as long as you never quit. And so, that's how you enjoy your life and your wealth, and there's your blueprint.